Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us our usual discussion with Professor Satyajit Rat. Satyajit, lots of issues on the COVID-19 front and of course we can only pick one or two of them. The first one is Let's talk about somebody has written a paper in which it has been claimed that with 20 to 25 percent infections, which would have provided direct immunity because of the COVID-19 infection itself, we already have a natural coronavirus immunity of 50, 45, 50 percent. So we are close to reaching not the herd mentality of Donald Trump but the herd immunity uh, point. How correct is that? How, are this, how seriously are these two figures to be taken? About particularly the 45-50% figure that we have a natural immunity, so to say, against COVID-19. There is a saying in Marathi, which translated says, that if you have a mouth of Fufi Ji, in other words, you can imagine all sorts of explanatory scenarios, all of which makes some level of plausible sense. Whether any of them actually apply or not is a whole different problem altogether. But the fundamental issue in all of this is, I think, something that we have uh, referred to in other earlier conversations as well, and that is a basic misunderstanding of what the notion of herd immunity is. So let us, let us recapitulate what herd immunity means before we come to the uh, argument that you're referring to, which I think comes from Moin Salim uh, writing letters in the Lancet, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, somewhere. That's right. So here's what herd immunity means. You have an, we have an epidemic, diseases spread, there are lots of ill people, large numbers in short time, and then these numbers begin to go down in large communities. At that point, when the numbers have gone down to the point of, oh, there are practically no, practically no new cases, or there are only a few cases these days every day. At that point, you turn around and ask, well, because the disease was here, the infectious disease was here, and it, it's no longer coming up as a disease, that must be because everybody's already exposed and immune. So you test and you discover that everybody is not immune, that some 60% or 70% or 80% people are immune, but there's a good 30% percent odd, for example, that's not immune. And yet the disease is not spreading amongst them either at that time. That's the point at which you make an ex post facto explanatory idea called herd immunity, where you say that this is happening, this must be happening because there is herd immunity, which for this particular infectious agent in this particular community at this particular time is providing a break in transmission with only 60 to 70 percent people immune. And that's how it's protecting the others. This is an ex post facto and explanatory. Converting this into the opposite argument that here is a new infectious disease and my argument is oh if we have 60 percent 70 percent 25 plus 50 percent of indeterminate immunity which is moin salim's argument it, it, some x percentage of prior exposure in the community is going to mean a break in transmission chain is inverting the argument that we began with. The only situation in which the phrase herd immunity, 
I'm, I'm, I'm struggling not to follow the leader of the free world and refer to it as her mentality. Um, but this is not easy because, you know, uh, he is the leader. But the fact that in one particular infectious disease where this has happened to you, natural infection has led to a lot of uh, uh, disease outbreak and then subsidence. And you've tested repeatedly that about 70% of people are immune and the disease does not transmit. At that point, you say, now here is a prediction. If we have a vaccine that works well, then a 70% coverage with the vaccine will achieve the same herd immunity and will provide community protection. This is a far more complex, nuanced and limited idea of herd immunity. The way everybody is throwing around the phrase herd immunity, it, it may just as well be herd mentality. So Trump is not completely out on that one, what you say. Well, you, you keep in mind that he expects herd mentality to cure uh, his uh, xenophobic virus. Xenophobic virus and also make him win the elections, for which, unfortunately, the vaccine scenario that he had created, uh, that permission to be given for emergency use by end of October, 1st November, delivery across the United States, and hopefully then influencing the November election. That seems to be at the moment not really working out. Well, you know, I mean, for me, the connection between what what I'm complaining about, frankly, loudly, which is what I'm calling a misunderstanding of, of the idea of herd immunity, connects to the broader fact that governments across the world and the US and India being very uh, prominent examples, both being very prominent examples, are fundamentally focused on a certain kind of hype unanchored by reality about the pandemic. And as a result, all sorts of strange outcomes are turning up. So as you point out, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC in the United States and the Federal Drug Authority, the US FDA, are both being pressured to do all sorts of things. So the CDC is issuing advisories, withdrawing them, reissuing them in modified fashion. The, the whole thing is, is an atrocious mess. Exactly similarly, as you point out, the US FDA is issuing emergency use authorizations left, right, and center. Like they're uh, the presidential favorites, polo mates. Um, they are apparently presidential favorites. Um, and so we had a completely evidence-free authorization for hydroxychloroquine. We had a completely evidence-free emergency use authorization for um, uh, plasma, con convalescent plasma therapy. We now have the CDC and the FDA together thinking that they will say that they will authorize an emergency use authorization for, for vaccine candidates based on, as we said earlier, bare bones efficacy data. And from that point of view, it's very interesting that both Moderna and Pfizer have released much more detail about their clinical trials than private pharmaceutical companies ordinarily do. Now, this is from the point of view of public health activists. This is a very good thing, regardless of why they are doing it. I mean, they are doing it for their own public relations purposes. But nonetheless, it's a good thing. But here's the interesting thing that begins to emerge. And that is, are we looking for protection against infection? Meaning simply, is the virus growing in my throat? Or are we looking for protection against actual disease? Meaning, is the vaccine protecting me from being sick? These two are not necessarily exactly the same thing. 
and the way that the details of the trials are being released the trials just one of those trials is obviously being gamed a little bit within acceptable limits but nonetheless is being gamed a little bit to provide the lowest bar possible to cross of 50% protective efficacy so that licensing can be done um Eric Paul for example has pointed this out in some detail so this is one way of governments doing favorable publicity spinning at the cost of both transparent information and trust and reliability you know on the other hand we have the government of india yeah we'll come to the government of india just a little later just to take you on on the issue of the modern and pfizer interestingly modern and pfizer also required refrigeration freezing essentially freezers for the vaccine cold chain much more than the existing vaccines do except one or two also require freezers i think the mmr vaccine has some such requirement but that itself would be not an easy task for the united states even the united states for against india to put together in such a hurry so let us let us simply underline the the, the sheer difficulty the united states government has instructed state governments remember this is a federal system so states are much more empowered unlike clearly in india um and and the federal government in the us has instructed state governments to come up with plans for vaccine storage vaccine distribution and vaccine immunization based implementation campaigns so there are two problems with this particular vaccine in the purely logistical issues of implementation one as you point out is that some of them in fact don't just require a refrigerator in fact none of them can do with just a refrigerator they at least require a minus 20 degrees celsius freezer some of them require a minus 70 or a minus 80 degrees uh, temperature freezer storage states in the us have been saying anxiously we don't have this kind of storage capacity at scale in decentralized in a fashion to serve a vaccination campaign a mass vaccination campaign if the if american states cannot provide this how exactly is india going to implement this so i ask again for the nth time in our conversations we have a vaccine implementation strategy group that the government of india has constituted under a i think a niti aayog member is chair why do we keep hearing complete silence from that group about what are the plans we have a one or two line blanket statements we are planning and that's all we really hear that brings me down since you wanted to raise the issue of sorry probir the second point less yeah. our our audience forget it is that all of these are two dose vaccines yes so the logistics are immeasurably more complicated because you have to keep track of who's gotten the first and when they've gotten the first and when they should come back 3 or 4 weeks later for the second so and you have to provide is- the cold chain for also maintaining this for at least 3 months that this must be in operation in order to be able to vaccinate in the united states a significant part of the population absolutely okay. coming back to the indian issue that you already touched upon that we we don't hear anything about how we are going to solve the logistical problem which is difficult enough for the united states hopefully we are planning on the oxford vaccine which has less rigorous cold chain requirement it is a 2 to 8 degree centigrade vaccine am i right storage wise well the, i'm that itself is going to be a massive problem in india at scale for 1.3 billion people it exactly. is a huge problem because polio you have to do it for a much smaller number and even that we had a lot of problems with the cold chain as you are aware of but so let me offer the actual numbers in comparison Yeah. in the childhood immunization program that we have in the country where 
public health matter children are immunized by a certain schedule with a certain bunch of half a dozen plus vaccines right we are immunizing about 8 crore people individuals okay. approximately i think to go from 8 crore to 80 crore which is what this no herd mentality is going to demand at the very least is a tenfold expansion of capacity and in far we are hoping for far less than one year three months six months eight months so we are talking about not just a twofold increase in the logistical strain we're talking about a 20 fold increase in logistical strain why are we not hearing any planning whatsoever thank you satish for being with us going through rather complex issues at in complex times we'll continue to discuss covid-19 with you it seems for at least next 3 to 6 months if we are lucky longer if we are not this is all the time we have for this click today do keep watching our shows our videos and do visit our website Thank <laughs> you.